back to Studio Lou. It's Cindy, and welcome to Chapter 2 of The Reading of Winter by Dallas Laura Sharp. This is a slow TV episode where I just do a little bit of making in the background while I read this wonderful seasonal story to you, so I hope you enjoy it. Chapter 2, The Turkey Drive. The situation was serious enough for the two boys. It was not a large fortune, but it was their whole fortune that straggled along the slushy road in the shape of 500 weary, hungry turkeys, which were looking for a roosting place. But there was no place where they could roost, no safe place, as the boys well knew, for on each side of the old road stretched the forest trees, a dangerous and in the weakened condition of the turkeys, an impossible roost on such a night as was coming. For the warm south wind had begun to veer to the north, the slush was beginning to grow crusty, and a fine sifting of snow was slanting through the open trees. Although it was still early afternoon, the gloom of the night had already settled over the forest, and the turkeys with empty crops were peevishly searching the bare trees for a roost. It was strange, slow procession that they made. Here in the New Brunswick forest, the flock of 500 turkeys, told forward boy, by a boy of 18, kept in line by a well-trained shepherd dog that raced up and down the straggling column, and urged on in the rear by a boy of 19, who was followed in his turn by an old horse and farm wagon creeping along behind. It was growing more difficult all the time to keep the turkeys moving, but they must not be allowed to stop until the darkness should put an end to the march, and they must not be allowed to take to the trees at all. Some of them indeed were too weak to roost high, but the flock would never move forward again if exposed in the tall trees on such a night as this promised to be. The thing to do was to keep them stirring. Once allow them to halt, give one of them time to pick out a roosting limb for himself, and the march would be over for that afternoon. The boys knew their flock. This was not their first drive. They knew from experience that once a turkey gets it into his small head to roost, he is bound to roost. Nothing will stop him. And in this matter, the flock acts as a single bird. In the last village, back along the road through which they had passed, this very flock took a notion suddenly to go to roost, and to go to roost on a little chapel as the vesper bells were tolling. The bells were tolling, the worshippers were gathering, when, with a loud gobble, one of the turkeys in the flock sailed into the air and alighted upon the ridgepole beside the belfry. Instantly, the flock broke ranks, ran wildly round the little building, and with a clamor they drowned the vesper bell, came down on the chapel in a feathered congregation that covered every shingle of the roof. Only the humor and quick wit of the kindly old priest prevented the superstitious of his people from going into a panic. The service had to wait until the birds made themselves comfortable for the night. Belfry, roof, window sills, the porch steps thick with roosting turkeys. The boys had come to have almost a fear of this mania for roosting, for they never knew when it might break out or what strange turn it might take. They knew now as the woods and the snow and the grey dusk began to thicken that the flock must not go to roost. Even the dog understood the signs, the peevish quint, 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 the sudden bolting of some gobbler into the brush, the stretching necks, the lagging steps, and redoubled his efforts to keep the line from halting. For two days, the flock had been without food. Almost a week's supply of grain, enough to carry them through to the border, had been loaded into the wagon before starting it upon this wild, deserted road through the Black Creek region. But the heavy day-long snowstorm had prevented their moving at all for one day, and had made travel so nearly impossible since that here they were, facing a blizzard, with night upon them, five hundred starving turkeys straggling wearily before them, and a two days' drive yet to go. The two brothers had got a short leave from college and had started their turkey drive in the more settled regions back from the New Brunswick border. They had brought up the turkeys from farm to farm, had herded them in one great flock as they drove them leisurely along, and had moved all the while toward the state line, whence they planned to send them through Maine for the New England market. Upon reaching the railroad, they would rest and feed the birds, and ship them in a special freight car ordered in advance to a Boston commission house, sell the horse and rig for what they could get, and with their dog go directly back to college. More money than they actually possessed had gone into the daring venture, but the drive back had been more than successful until the beginning of the Black Creek Road. The year before, they had gone over the same route, 
which they had chosen because it was sparsely settled and because the prices were low. This year, the farmers were expecting them. The turkeys were plentiful and the traveling had been good until this early snow had caught them here in the backwoods and held them. And now, with the sudden shift of the wind again to the north, it threatened to delay them farther, past all chance of bringing a single turkey through alive. But George and Herbert Topman had not worked their way into their junior year at college to sit down by the roadside while there was light to travel by. They were not the kind to let their turkeys go to roost before sundown. It was a slow and solemn procession that moved through the woods, but it moved toward a goal that they had set for that day's travel. All day, at long intervals, as they had pushed along the deep forest road, the muffled rumble of distant trains had come to them through the silence, and now, although neither of them had mentioned it, they were determined to get out somewhere near the tracks before the night and storm should settle down upon them. Their road, hardly more than a wide trail, must cross the railroad tracks, as they remembered it, not more than two or three miles ahead. Leaving more and more of the desolate forest behind them with every step, they plodded doggedly on, but there was so much of the same desolate forest still before them. Yet yonder, and not far away, was the narrow path of the iron track through the interminable waste, something human, the very sight of it enough to warm and cheer them. They would camp tonight, where they could go see a train go by. The leaden sky lowered closer upon them. The storm had not yet got under full headway, but the fine icy flakes were flying faster, slanting farther, and the wind was beginning to drone through the trees. Without halt, the flock moved on through the thickening storm, but the dog was having all they could do to help the stragglers in order, and George, in the rear, saw that they must stir the flock, for the birds were gradually falling back into a thick bunch before him. Hurrying back to the wagon, he got two loaves of bread, and ran ahead with them to Herbert. The famished turkeys seemed to know what he carried and broke into a run after him. For half a mile they kept up the gate, as both boys, trotting along the road, dropped pieces of bread on the snow. Then the whole game had to be repeated. For the larger part of the flock, falling hopelessly behind, soon forgot what they were running after and began to cry, quint, 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 the roosting cry. So, starting again in the rear with the bread, George carried the last of the flock forward for another good run. We should win this game, Herbert panted, if only we had loaves enough to make a few more touchdowns. There's half an hour yet to play, was George's answer. But what on? On our nerve now, the older boy replied grimly. That railroad is not far ahead, said Herbert. Half an hour ahead, we've got to camp by that track tonight, or, or what? But George had turned to help the dog head off some runaways. Herbert, picking up a lump of frozen leaves and snow, began to break this in front of the flock to toll them on. He had hardly started the birds again when a long-legged gobbler brushed past him and went swinging down the road, calling quint, quint, quint to the flock behind him. The call was taken up and passed along the now extended line, which, breaking immediately into double quick, went streaming after him. Herbert got out of the way to let them pass, too astonished for a moment to do more than watch them go. It was the roosting cry. An old gobbler had given it, but as it was taking him for once in the right direction, Herbert ordered back the dog and had dashed forward to head him off and fell in with George to help the stragglers in the rear. As the leggards were brought up to a slight rise in the road, the flock was seen a hundred yards ahead, gathered in a dark mass about a telegraph pole. It could be nothing else, for through the whirling snow the big cross arms stood out, dim but unmistakable. It was this that the gobbler had spied and started for, this sawed and squared piece of timber that had suggested a barnyard to him, corn and roost, as to the boys it meant a human presence in the forest and something like human companionship. It was four o'clock now, and the night was hard upon them. The wind was strengthening every minute, the snow was coming finer and swifter. The boys' worst fears about the storm were beginning to be realized. But the sight of the railroad track heartened them. The strong-armed poles and their humming wires reached out hands of hope to them, and getting among the turkeys, they began to hurry them off the track and down the steep embankment, which fortunately offered them here some slight protection from the wind. But as fast as they pushed the birds off, the one-minded things came back on the track. The whole flock, meanwhile, was scattering up and down the iron rails and settling calmly down upon them for the night. They were going to roost upon the track. The railroad bank shelved down to the woods on each side, 
and along its whitened peak lay the two black rails like ridge poles along the length of a long roof. In the thick half-light of the whirling snow, the turkeys seemed suddenly to find themselves at home, and as close together as they could crowd, with their breasts all up to the storm, they arranged themselves in two long lines upon the steel rails. And nothing could move them. As fast as one was tossed down the bank, up he came. Starting down the lines, the boys pushed and shoved to clear the track, but the lines reformed behind them quickly, evenly, and almost without a sound. As well try to sweep back the waves of the sea. They worked together to collect a small band of the birds and drive them into the edge of the woods, but every time the band dwindled to a single turkey that dodged between their legs toward its place on the roost. The two boys could have kept two turkeys off the rail, but not five hundred. The game is up, George, said Herbert, as the sickening thought of a passing train swept over him. The words were hardly uttered when there came the tankle-tankle of the big cowbell hanging from the collar of the horse that was just now coming up to the crossing. George caught his breath and started over to stop the horse when, above the loud hum of the wires and the sound of the wind in the forest trees, they heard through the storm the muffled whistle of a locomotive. "'Quick, the horse, Herbert, hitch him to a tree and come,' called George, as he dived into the wagon and pulled out their lantern. "'Those birds could wreck the train,' he shouted and hurried forward along the track with his lighted lantern in his hand." It was not the thought of the turkeys, but the thought of the people on the flying Montreal Express, if that it was, that sped him up the track. In his imagination, he saw the wreck of a ditched train below him, the moans of a hundred mangled beings he heard sounding in his ears. On into the teeth of the blinding storm he raced, while he strained his eyes for a glimpse of the coming train. The track seemed to lie straight away in front of him, and he bent his head for a moment before the wind when, out of the smother of the snow, the flaring headlight leaped almost upon him. He sprang aside, stumbled, and pitched headlong down the bank as the engine of a freight with a roar that dazed him swept past. But the engineer had seen him, and there was a screaming of iron brakes, a crashing of cars together, and a long-drawn shrieking of wheels as the heavy train slid among the slippery rails to a stop. As the engineer swung down from his cab, he was met to his great astonishment by a dozen turkeys clambering up the embankment toward him. He had ploughed his way well among the roosting flock and brushed them unhurt from the rails as the engine skidded along to its slow stop. By the time the conductor and the train hands had run forward to see what it all meant and stood looking at the strange obstruction on the track when Herbert came into the glare of the headlight and joined them. Then George came panting up and the boys tried to explain the situation, but their explanation only made a case of sheer negligence out of what at first had seemed a mystery to the trainmen. Both the engineer and the conductor were anxious and surly. Their train was already an hour late. There was a through express behind, and the track must be cleared at once. And they fell at once to clearing it. Conductor, fireman, brakeman, and the two boys. Those railroad men had never tried to clear a track of roosting turkeys before. They cleared it, a little of it, but it would not stay cleared, for the turkeys slipped through their hands, squeezed between their legs, ducked about their heels, and got back into place. Finally, the conductor, putting two men in line on each rail, ordered the engineer to follow slowly, close upon their heels, with the train as they scattered the birds before them. The boys had not once thought of themselves. They had had only time to think of anything but the danger and the delay that they had caused. They helped with all their might to get the train through, and as they worked, silently listened to the repeated threats of the conductor. At last, with a muttered something, the conductor kicked one of the turkeys into a fluttering heap beneath the engine, and, turning, commanded his crew to stand aside and let the engineer finish the rest of the flock. The men got away from the track, then, catching Herbert by the arm, George pointed along the train, and, bending, made a tossing motion toward the top of the cars. "'Quick!' he whispered. "'One on every car!' And, stepping calmly back in front of the engine, he went down the opposite side of the long train." As he passed the tender, he seized a big gobbler and sent him with a wild throw up to the top of a low coal car, just as Herbert on his side sent another fluttering up to the same perch. Both birds landed with a flap and a gobble that were heard by the other turkeys up and down the length of the train. Instantly came a chorus of answering gobbles as every turkey along the track saw in the failing light that real buildings, farmyard buildings, were here to roost on and into their air they went, helped all along the train by the two boys who were tossing them into the cars or upon the loads of lumber as fast as they could pass from car to car. 
Luckily, the rails were sleety and the mighty driving wheels, spinning on the ice with their long load, which seemed to freeze continually to the track, made headway so slowly that the whole flock had come to roost upon the cars before the train was fairly moving. Conductor and brakeman, hurrying back to the board, the caboose, were midway of the train before they noticed what was happening. How it was happening they did not see at all, so hidden were the movements of the two boys in the swirl of the blinding snow. But just for an instant the conductor checked himself, but it was too late to do anything. The train was moving, and he must keep it moving as fast as he could to the freight yards ahead at the junction, the very yards where even now an empty car was waiting for the overdue turkeys. As he ran on down the track and swung aboard the caboose, two other figures closed in behind the train. One of them, seizing the other by the arm, landed him safe upon the steps, and then, shouting at him through the storm, "'Certainly you shall. I'm safe enough. I'll drive on to that old sawmill tonight. Feed him in the morning and wait for me. Goodbye!' And as the wind carried his voice away, George Totman found himself staring after a ghost-white car that had vanished in the storm. He was alone, but the thought of the great flock speeding on to the town ahead was company enough. Besides, he had had too much to do, and to do quickly, to think of himself, for the snow was blocking his road, and the cold was getting at him. But now the wires overheard sang to him. How the sounding forest sang to him as he went back to give the horse a snatch of supper. He was soon on the road, where the wind at his back and the tall trees gave him protection. The four-wheeled wagon pulled hard through the piling snow, but the horse had had an easy day, and George kept going until, toward eight o'clock, he drew up behind a lofty pile of slabs and sawdust at the old mill. A wilder storm never filled the resounding forests of the north. The old mill was far from being proof against the fine icy snow, but when George rolled himself in the heavy blanket and lay down beside his dog, it was to go to sleep to the comfortable munching of the horse and with the thought that Herbert and the turkeys were safe. And they were safe. It was late in the afternoon the next day when George, having left the wagon at the mill, came floundering behind the horse through the unbroken road into the streets of the junction to find Herbert anxiously waiting for him and the turkeys with full crops, trying hard to go for the roost inside their double-decked car. 